Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. It's like coffee with an analyst, or it could be whiskey with an analyst reading a spreadsheet, linking crime events, identifying a series, and getting the latest scoop on association news and training. So please don't beat that analyst and join us as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has seven years of law enforcement analysis experience with 14 years total of law enforcement experience. He's an officer turned defense manager turned intelligence analyst representing the great state of Michigan. Please welcome Nicholas Lutens. Nick, how are we doing? I'm doing excellent, man. All right. Thank you for joining me. So my first question to you is, is Jim Harbaugh leaving? I think that Jim Harbaugh is the best that anyone's ever going to find. I'm not a huge U of M fan. Um, at the same time, you're not going to find better for that program. So I would say no. Very good. I love how you answered that question without skipping a beat. So that I'm, I'm from East good. Lansing, so I could care less. But but I yeah. don't think that you're ever going to get a better coach for that program than Harbaugh. He yeah. was the dream. So they got to make him work. Yeah, that's funny. So are you a Michigan State fan then? I am. Nice. Yeah, I don't know. I just saw a headline this morning with Harborough maybe going to the Raiders. Yeah. That's an interesting uh, That's a, a return to the NFL for him. So Yeah, anyway. so I think if he's gone, he's going to the NFL. I think that's the only way he would leave. I don't think he sure. would be leaving to go to a different college program, well, I no, think. And, yeah. and U of M will not find a better coach than him, so they need to do what they need to do to make him stay. Yeah. All right. So as I mentioned in the intro, you have an interesting – career thus far as you started out as an officer at uh, Lawrence Kansas which is the University of Kansas Police Department and then you work your way up to the Department of Defense and now you're in Grand Rapids as an intelligence analyst so let's go back then and just talk a little bit about get your perspective on becoming a police officer back in October of 2008 well I think it's very kind that you call my career interesting. Um, it's kind of <laughs> kind of all over the place. So I went to Kansas after graduating college in Michigan, followed a girl down there, and that didn't work out. But um, I, I went down and wanted to be an officer. I interviewed at a number of places, and I got picked up, went to the, the, through the academy in Kansas, kind of the classic story. So I think that law enforcement has changed drastically in that when I graduated from college in 2000. 7, 2008, it, there were no jobs in Michigan. Um, there was just becoming a cop in Michigan was exceedingly difficult. So a lot of people left. Um, and I found a job down there. The academy was awesome. It's very different um, down there from Michigan where they paid you a full salary. You interviewed with the police department and um, went through the academy and collected a paycheck while you were in the academy. They really invest in their officers down there. And it was great. I was extremely lucky to have the mentors and leaders that I did. What did you find the most challenging with the academy? So uh, I can't speak for every academy. I've heard a lot of horror stories from academies. I really enjoyed my academy time. I felt like my instructors genuinely cared that we absolutely knew and learned everything. Mm -hmm. um, everything was really well structured from you did a classroom and then you did more of a hands-on in the classroom practical. And then you did the real thing out on the street for every unit and then went back. And I think that the challenging part of it was um, they, they harp on you every day that people's lives depend on you. And up until that point, I had never had a job where they did. Um, I'd done some lifeguarding in high school and college, but um, <laughs> short of that, not, not quite the same. So so the idea that every day mattered was probably the most challenging thing that that, that I have to keep going because there's people who rely on me. The first couple of days on the job or maybe the first couple of months on the job, what do you think of when you think back? It was really hard. FTO is really, really hard. Um, I remember when I first started out, I don't think that I was ready for policing. I took a break there. After my first FTO, I was like, you know, I don't know if this is for me. And I did ultimately end up coming back. It's hard. FTO is really difficult, especially where I was. Um, the Lawrence, Kansas Police Department is absolutely nothing but the finest of people. And um, they challenge the hell out of you. Can I say hell? I don't know. Yes, you please. can. Yes, you can. Okay. And, and uh, what's yeah. FT FTO real quick? Field training options. Okay. When you're when you're a field training officer, um, you're you're in field training. Um, it's it's where you take everything you learned in the academy and learn that it's nice that you know that, but this is how the real world works. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult. I ended up coming back and doing oh, about four years on patrol with the university, and uh, I loved it. I learned a lot. It, it was it was just a cool cool experience, cool time in my life. It's very much 
you learn that you policing is not a job, it's a lifestyle, that it's not something that you can walk away from, that your your life revolves around that, um, that you're always a cop no matter where you go. So Okay. And then did you find it, when it comes to being a, a university cop, do you think it was very much different being a patrol officer with the university oh, as opposed to with the city? What, what made it different? I mean, your population is completely different. The community you serve is completely different. The motivations of the department are completely different. I loved it. I thought it was great. I think that especially in large universities, university cops don't get enough credit for what they have to deal with. <laughs> I can um, only imagine. I, I can tell you that I'm glad that I left when I did. And the reason is because I, I don't know that 20 years at that job would have been extremely difficult. You know, once you have kids and, and a life and you've moved on, I, I can't see dealing with some of those issues day in and day out. Well, I, more power to those people who can. Oh, man. What's um, the craziest thing you saw? Oh, man. You see so much. Um, with, like You get, especially with kids. I remember I had a, <laughs> it started as just a, a stop in the middle of the road. There was a bunch of random people peeing near a fountain in <laughs> KU. There's a huge fountain there. And there were some girls and guys, you know, drunk as heck, peeing in a fountain. I got a call later in the night from some guy outside of a dorm room and he was screaming at the top of his lungs for some girl. And I get there and there's a guy in a tux and he's covered in mud and trying to find his girlfriend. And long story short, I found out that he was at a party where he was a jerk and passed out. And some guys he didn't know drove him out to the middle of nowhere in a cornfield and left him. And he somehow made his way back to the university and found where he thought her dorm room was and was screaming and looking for her. And after spending all night trying to find this girl who's now a missing person because he reported her missing, I found out it was the girl I wrote a ticket for peeing in the fountain for earlier that night. <laughs> so she- I mean... <laughs> And that's the regular. <laughs> like, I was like, wait a minute, I know you. And she was like, yeah, you just wrote me a ticket for peeing on the sidewalk. I was like, ah, oh, look at that small world. Well, I guess at least she wasn't missing, right? <laughs> yeah. And, but like at a, on a university, it's that every day. I mean, every day is something, you know, and you have to go from those, those funny stories and dealing with drunk students to um, ready for an active shooter, sadly. Yeah. And so I think that, again, university cops, I don't think get enough credit for what they're tasked with doing. Suicide is one another thing that I thought of, yeah, too, is, is something that they deal with that's, that's pretty disturbing. Yeah, it's not always drunk college parties. Sometimes it's incredibly serious and you have to be ready to deal with all of it. And I think that um, it, it was a challenging job and I loved it. I, I really did. And I, I really, um, I still admire and love the people that that do it. A lot of, I still have a couple of friends that are in that in that game, so. So in 2010 then, you joined the U.S. Army Reserves. So I did, yeah. What, what made you sign up for the Reserves? I'll tell you that I, I looked at a lot of the officers that I looked up to, um, that I had in FTO, and that I saw getting promoted that were in leadership positions, and they all were military, and they seemed to have something that that I didn't. Um, it was this just this confidence with how they carried themselves, how they handled situations, and, and I wanted that. I wanted that really bad, and so I started talking to some, and and I joined. I really thought the military would give it to me, and I was not disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> now, how would you compare basic training with the reserves with at the academy for the police department? I think they were completely different. I think basing, basic training in the Army, I'm going to tell you now, people will disagree, but the, <laughs> the only thing you got to do is not quit. Oh, okay. um, in the Army, you just have to give it everything you have and not quit every day, and you'll be fine. That's not the case for the police department. You were always one test away from washing out or, you know what I mean? Um, yes. You, it, it's the police department, I think, was a lot harder, especially mentally. You have to know the law and they test you on it. You, you're going through classes with lawyers and attorneys and you're taking these huge tests and you absolutely better be taking notes and you have to know your stuff. It is not that way in the army. If you don't pass your first marksmanship test, they're just going to test you again. If you don't pass your PT test, they're going to make you work out nonstop all day, every day, and then they're going to test you again. And in the police department, I think the standards were quite high. That's interesting. And I, I haven't looked at any of the stats yet, but I'm always astonished how many folks sign up for the academy, start going through the academy one way or the other, and then how many actually finish. I want to say like a third fail. Like a third don't finish. 
I would believe that. And which which seems like a lot to go through, because even to get to just to start the academy, you're talking about background checks and all that work. I mean, it's a six month process just to get to the academy. I I also think there's a there's a veil over there about what being a police officer really is. And um, until you experience it, until you sit in the car and until you realize you're the one who's going to the call, I don't think you really know whether or not you're cut out for that job. I think Uh, everyone has that moment where they're like, wow, I'm I'm really doing it now it's not for everybody and that's okay there that was one thing that i learned is it's okay for policing not to be for you there's absolutely nothing wrong with that okay all right yeah so you're in the reserves for eight years Are actually you... nine yeah oh nine. Uh, my, my resume is a little off there i was off i, I got out in 19 all right bad intel right <laughs> so... yeah that's right <laughs> So since it's the reserves, one weekend a month, two weeks Uh, out of the year, is that what the standard was? Kind of. So that time was a little different. Generally, yes, that's what it is. I will tell you that I might get yelled at by friends, but um, the the reserves tells you it's going to be one weekend a month, you know, and, and it's just not, that's just not the reality of it, that in order for you to take care of your soldiers and to be a good leader, it's going to take a lot more time than that. And and that's just the very nature of being a leader. You you can't expect to know people and care for them only seeing them once a month. That's just not how that works. Um, so yes, that's how it started. After my first deployment, I, I came back and I wanted to do something different. I really wanted to go full-time intel. I really wanted to do my job that I was doing for the reserve all the time because I fell in love with it. So I did uh, for as much as there's nine years of time there. Um, some of that was active. Some of that was reserve. Some of that was with the Pentagon. But I, I, I really fell in love with the job when I deployed. Yeah. So it sounds like you got two things there from the reserve. One, you got exposure to intelligence and also you yeah. got management experience. I did. I did. I um, I, I was, like I said, I, I think that part of my success has been in just the luck of having incredible leaders around me, incredible NCOs above me in the army. I had great leaders at both the police departments. I had um, amazing trainers um, in the academy. And and as a result, when I got into the Army, I was put in a position of leadership fairly quickly. Okay. So what kind of projects were you working on overseas when you went? Well, I can tell you that the unit that I was assigned to, the 338th Intel, I don't even think exists anymore. I think they disbanded that for some uh, you know, larger military reason. But the majority of the work that I was focused on was doing interrogations inside a prison in uh, Afghanistan. And then after about two months of supporting those ops, probably, um, they asked for volunteers and I got pushed out to a special forces ODA. Um, so an operational detachment alpha, it's a small team with third group. And I was supporting their targeting and source intel ops. And it was awesome. Incredible people. So, man, so interrogation. So, I guess, man, I, there's a lot of a lot of angles I could <laughs> go with with that. So, there's the TV version of interrogation, and then there's real life. So, kind of compare and contrast, which you don't might somebody might be thinking of when you say, "Hey, you were doing interrogations in the military," versus what mm-hmm. you might see on TV. So, I would tell you that everything that I saw that I've ever seen on TV is absolutely false. Um, The prison that that I was in gets a lot of flack for whatever reason from a number of different groups. We served with MPs, we served with lawyers, we served with an intel unit. And my time inside the prison, I saw absolutely nothing but professionalism. It's not there's all these stories and horrible things that you hear that originated, you know, in the Iraq war. And I was never part of that, so I can't speak on it. But I know that in Afghanistan at Bagram, the the time that I was there, uh, our day amounted to going into intelligence cell and reviewing detainee folders, and then looking at what was happening in the country as a whole and finding people who might know something about that and asking them questions. It was always very, you know, the interrogators that I saw, it was more of an interview than an interrogation. Um, They usually had tea. They sat in a, I guess you'd call it a booth or cell that was relatively comfortable. They usually got to know the detainees and the the detainees knew them by a first name um, and they'd chat. And at this point, most of them had been locked up so long that it's not like they're giving us intel about what's happening right here, right now. It's more, you know, atmospheric conditions, but nonetheless, it was an important mission. For, for a military unit who's going to go out into the wilds of Afghanistan and needs to know what's in a village, that information can be crucial, you know. 
uh, knowing who the leaders are in a village or who the family with the, you know, the most power is. I mean, th those things are really important. So finding, using analytics to find detainees from those areas and get them to tell us the things that we need to know, which it's not, <laughs> it's not like the movies where it's like, where's the bomb? It's more <laughs> like, hey, like, tell us about your village, <laughs> you know? How much does it rain there? What kind of food do people eat? You know, uh, things that seem very, uh, I guess, innocuous and, and um, can be extremely helpful to units that got to go into those places. So I mentioned that a lot of it was trying to corroborate maybe other intelligence that you had. Absolutely. Okay. And, and to be fair, I only did that mission for about two or three months. And then I was pushed out to an ODA. And there I was out near the AFPAC border regions, sorry, Afghanistan, Pakistan border. And really, we were just doing security. We were looking for people on the intel side who, you know, statistically saying like, oh, they live in this area, they have this type of job, they probably know about X, Y, and Z, we should go build a relationship with them. And, and it, again, not at all like the movies. Sometimes the these were things that it seems like it would be of no military interest whatsoever. Things like, you know, a school principal might be able to tell me what the education is like in an area. Um, and so we want to go make a relationship with them because we never know. We, we might want to start letting girls go to that school and he's going to be the person to make that happen for us. So that's a huge thing for the U.S. It's a huge move forward, you know, in the fight in Afghanistan. But again, it's not where's the bomb, you know, that that stuff that you see on TV. Most of it was just about building relationships and trying to help people. Eventually you leave the University of Kansas Police Department and go work for the Department of Defense did, as an yeah. intelligence. So you're, you're you, as you were mentioning, you really got the taste of intelligence and wanted to do it full time. So let's talk about that position. Yeah. So I, I got picked up by the Pentagon immediately went back to Afghanistan. I did very little time in the U.S. before I went back to Afghanistan. And there I was working with a, a team that was, our, our mission was to develop rule of law in Afghanistan. So transitioning from that wartime effort and to, to, to a legal system, trying to develop that system, to bring legitimacy to that system. And then at the same time, trying to ensure U.S. interest in that system was met. So there were many Afghans that were tried for crimes against U.S. persons. We wanted to make sure that those people saw justice. What are some examples of the crimes? Well, any green on blue attack. We had a number of those that we were working. We watched those extremely closely. Many of those people, people don't realize that those prisons, they don't just go away. They transfer over to Afghan authority. And if the U.S. locks someone up for a really good reason, we want to make sure that when we transfer that over, that um, justice is served. And so anytime that a U.S. personnel was attacked on a base and that person was locked up in an Afghan prison, part of our mission was to make sure that we kept eyes on that case and that person so we could inform the families of the victims what had happened. Um, so that was that was part of that. And, um, you know, again, like maybe it's just luck. Maybe I'm just blessed. But my leaders were amazing. The colonel that I worked under, they were both incredible. I had amazing teams, amazing mentors during that as well. And we our goal was to build intel and legal capability um, for the Afghans. And, and uh, it was an awesome mission. Very, very cool thing to do. All right. And then, so you eventually make your way back to Michigan. And I did, yeah. so now currently you're an Intel analyst with Grand Rapids Police yep. Department. So what do you think uh, you brought with you in terms of your experience as an, both a police officer and your military experience? What did you bring into the job as an intelligence analyst? I think that that boots on the ground perspective is big. I think the other side of it is having been with the federal government, <laughs> it sounds bad, but when you have the federal government invests tons and tons of money in its soldiers, especially in Intel and their training into a police department. I mean, there, there's a whole lot of money they don't need to spend to make sure someone knows what they're doing and they're capable. So I, I think that there's that aspect of it that that was huge for the police department. To be fair, I, I didn't know that I would be a good crime analyst. I came back and was looking for jobs in policing. I was just like, well, I guess I can go back to being a cop. My, my next duty station for the Pentagon was going to be Kuwait. You know, when you request Europe or the U.S. and you get Kuwait, it's not. A, <laughs> they're like, oh, it's safe. You can bring your wife. And I was like, okay. <laughs> our, yeah, our definitions of fun differ greatly. So 
I, I wanted to uh, move on and do something else back home. Uh, my dad was very sick and I wanted to be close to him. And so I came back to Michigan looking for that. I took a job briefly with the Office of the Inspector General doing fraud analytics. Um, that was great. And my my team leader there, good guy, Wade, uh, told me about the Grand Rapids Police Department was looking for someone to build an intel team. Um, he said they specifically put it in the job description. And um, he said, didn't you do that in Afghanistan? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, why don't you just go over there? So I did. And, and I've been there for the last five years. All right. So then let's talk about building the team. What have you been able to accomplish in the last five years there? So I'll tell you that like most police departments, they started with pen maps. And, and I think that one of the interesting things about the way analytics is done is the different levels that it can be accomplished within a police department to make a difference. And one thing that Grand Rapids was looking for was the ability to support investigations. They wanted it, the ability to impact patrol operations on a greater level more so than just building pen maps for the chief. We immediately started by putting me down in the detective bureau and started with some very basic things like uh, social media search is something that I specialize in. Um, I do a lot of social media, deep web, dark web analytics. We started doing that for detectives. And then we got into things like link diagrams. I was responsible for getting the department their first version of I2 uh, analyst notebook ever. Um, and we started using that for timelining. We got into, we got away from the really, really old school Esri plugins. And now we're in Crime View and we're looking to move to Esri Pro so that we can do a lot more with geospatial data. And we've since hired two additional analysts, one that we've assigned at the strategic level, who's absolutely brilliant. She does a lot of SQL queries, some large data projects. We actually pulled her from the medical field, which I cannot recommend enough for analysts who, yeah, if you're looking for an analyst, look, look in the medical field. They hire some <laughs> of the best and brightest to do because it's all about money and patience for them. And so they get to walk that line with the community and health, um, but also with data analytics. And so you get someone who already has that mindset of helping people, but understanding the bigger picture. Yeah. So Debbie's been great. She's incredible. She works at that strategic level for the chief. She does a lot of resource management. She does a lot of call for service analytics. And then we hired Jen Zobel, who's also incredible. And she works directly for detectives now. Um, she's kind of taken over that role where she's doing investigative support and I'm working more on the patrol side. So we, we built a team originally. Um, we designed it so it'd be more of a fusion cell. So that was the other huge change is we put our mobile forensics people um, that are downloading phones. We put our video people and then our analysts all in the same cell. They're all located right in the detective bureau and we work together all the time. Um, so that's been a huge change and and we've moved forward on, I, I, I don't even think that, I don't think there's a, a serious case that's happened in Grand Rapids in three years that hasn't been touched by our unit. Nice. Um, so nice. yeah, it's been some big changes. What's next for the unit? You know what? I, I don't know. For the first time we have a sergeant really, really great guy who came to us from another department who had a very, very robust um, Intel unit. I, I don't know what he wants to do with it, but we support him. He, he's, he does. He's really great. He's got brilliant ideas and um, we're waiting for him to move us forward as a team. Okay. Good. Well, this brings us to the analyst badge stories. For, for those that may be new to the show, so the analyst badge story is the, the career defining case or project that a analyst works on. And so for you, Nick, you have two, one going back to your patrol days, and we'll start with that one. This deals with a reworking of some money and solving a problem that you were having at the police department. You know, yeah, I, I was an analyst for the military already, I believe, when it happened. And it was kind of that moment where I realized that I really, really enjoy doing this. I The, the police department there, and I don't know if they still do it, but um, they set aside some money in the budget, some overage for officers to decide how it's to be used. And talking to the other officers at the department, um, it sounded like in the past, they'd made requests that had been turned down for things like gym equipment or, oh, I don't know, fancy new computers or something. You know, they, they would request one physical thing and have it turned down. And I, I kind of looked at it like as a challenge. I was also a very new, very green, had no idea what I was doing officer. And I had big dreams. So I, I was like, you know what, I, I really want to tackle this and I want to do something awesome. So um, I had, I think the number was like five or $7,000 or something like that, that they had. And I did a ton of research. I pulled what officers were out on injury, why they were injured over the last several years, 
Turns out they were all lower back things. Um, I looked at uh, one of the big complaints and the big hot button topics at the time was mandatory vest policy. A lot of departments were going through that in the early to mid 2000s. Are we going to make people wear a vest or is it their choice? And I kind of did some research and found out that for the money that they were requesting, our officers could easily get uh, vest carriers, plate carriers, just like we had in the army. They could put their equipment anywhere they wanted. So it was customizable to the officer. So it makes them safer. And then by getting the weight off of their belt, they're preventing injury to their lower back. And I was like, so the department's going to love it because they're saving a ton of money in workman's comp. Officers are going to like it because they can put their stuff wherever they want and they finally have space that they can work with. They're going to be a lot more comfortable. And for on the safety aspect, now you have a mandatory vest policy, kind of a workaround because you can't go to work without all your stuff in your vest. I presented it. It got accepted. As far as I know, they're still wearing the vest carriers and they still have to wear their vests. And I don't know if everybody liked it, but I really enjoyed doing it. And the chief really liked it. And that was the first time I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool and pretty rewarding. And I really loved doing the research and the analytics side of it. So you turned it in from a a bat belt to a bat vest. Yeah. (laughs) And so, but that's a great problem solving project and letting the data drive the decision. So that yeah, that is a it, great example. I enjoyed the heck out of it. I really did. Did you get much feedback afterwards from from the officers? Oh yeah, some of the officers were calling me the MVP, meaning the mandatory <laughs> vest policy. Um, some of them didn't like. It. Some of them really did. Um, yeah. There was there was a couple of my friends who reached out and were like, "Dude, these are awesome! Like they're more comfortable. They really like that you can wear whatever you want generally underneath it, whether it's a t-shirt or a polo or a long sleeve. Your jacket fit, you know, th- so they could be comfortable depending on the weather and still look professional because the vest is what carried your badge and your pens and made you look like a cop. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. and, and I, I do believe that they still use it. I've seen pictures of uh, from friends on Facebook and stuff in uniform, and they're still wearing them. As far as I know, I don't know." If they're mandatory anymore, but um, hopefully it reduced their their injuries on the job too. Good. So you, your other badge story is more recent. This deals yeah. with a dismemberment case there at Grand Rapids. Yeah. So um, I have to remember when this was, but it was probably just a couple years ago. A kid named Jared Chance. I want to say that we're talking maybe 2017, 2018, invited a girl to Grand Rapids that he had known from his past and um, then he murdered her. Um, He murdered her and he cut her into pieces and he tried to dispose of the body. His parents tried to help him. It was the most recent time that I could remember where we had all hands on deck doing everything that we possibly could to figure out what had happened because you have those cases every so often that are so complex that beyond just the the events that happened, but the number of people involved. We had officers on the scene who were taking statements. This case involved the kid doing all this. And the, the we were tipped off by, um, I believe the first time was the girl's parents and friends in Kalamazoo hadn't seen her. So she was reported missing and through the grapevine and heard that she might have went to Grand Rapids to drink and party with friends. And so um, it started as a missing persons. And you can read about this online, but um, it, it turned out to be many, many detectives um, were working many, many hours to do this. But we did everything in the analyst toolkit that you can think of from timelining to link diagramming to association matrices to um, video analysis to phone analysis to figure out what had happened. He was, I believe, sentenced to like 200 years or something like that for the death and murder and dismemberment. And his parents were also charged as well because it was our analytics that uncovered that they'd helped him, that he had called his parents to help dispose of the body and they helped him. So we had analysts on site for the search warrant at the apartment. We had analysts on site for the search warrant at the parents' house. We did everything from downloading routers and computers and cell phones, doing the analytics on those cell phones, and then matching up timelines and calls and everything to support the detectives in any way we could. Seeing him get 200 years was... uh, it was, it was definitely validating in what we do. So what's the, the time between when she's murdered and when the body is discovered? Not long. I will tell you that I, I don't have the case right in front of me, but she goes missing. Um, she's murdered that night. And I believe by the next day, patrol is looking for her. Um, and I think that less than 24 hours goes by before. So really weird instance in that. His dad 
and him walked into the police department. So he had called his dad and said, hey, uh, we don't know what he said, but something to the effect that I killed someone, we think. And his dad was a, I think he was in corrections or he was somehow associated with law enforcement. He drives him to the police station and says they need to talk to a detective. And the officer on duty asks, asks why. And he says, we're not going to talk without a lawyer. And people don't understand, like, you can't. <laughs> We don't know why, like, why would we get you a lawyer? You're not being charged with anything. Like what, you know, like if I, you want to talk to a detective about what? And they gave no information and left. Like they kept saying, we want to talk to a detective, but we're not doing it without a lawyer. And like, well, we can't get you a lawyer because you're not, like, you're not a suspect in anything. You have to help us out a little bit. Yeah. Chicken um, and egg. There's <laughs> cart horse, right? Exactly. Like, <laughs> hey, we will get you a lawyer if you can tell us what it is you're wanted for or what we're talking about here or and they ultimately end up leaving after a very and, and the conversation is very very short they end up leaving and then it's on our detectives to put everything together and make those arrests and they found uh, i'll just say that her 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 body was not all together there was um most of it was still at the house but they were you know out of respect for the family i just i'd rather not but it it, it was a difficult case it was very very difficult um they traveled all over the city and then they left and went to another city um, about an hour away. Um, so they were all over the state, all over West Michigan and tracking them, serving those search warrants, assisting the detectives. Um, yeah, it was, it was quite the case. Yeah. You were tracking them via their cell phone. Um, we were tracking them via their cell phone. And then as, as well, um, there was, we, we have a video detective. He, he goes out and pulls video evidence all day, every day. He's incredible. And using his video, we were able to match up receipts from her credit card as well and, and match those with um, cell phone records. So we knew exactly where they were and when and how they traveled. Oh, I see. Okay. So again, yep. cor corroborating other intel. There you go. Yep. So that in, you, you saw that intel process happen where we said, okay, we have the phones. This is where we think we were. Anyone who's ever worked with phone data knows sometimes it's fantastic and sometimes it's worthless. They're like, oh, they're <laughs> in this. They were within 600 meters of this bubble. And you're like, oh, cool, thanks. <laughs> so they were in the city, you say, awesome. <laughs> um, so to take some of that data and then put those the receipts from credit cards and put social media posting and put her cell phone versus his cell phone versus parents' cell phone and then put the video from outside of businesses or ring cams from people's homes so we could see them walking down the street. All of that together is what made this case what it was. Okay. And, and like I said, the detectives were out there all day, every day, talking to people, pulling this information for us. So, um, I mean, they they were heroes, absolutely. Okay. So in terms of the link chart, when some people say link charts, they say that generically and they usually mean timeline. So was it just a timeline or was there a, a, a timeline oh, no, and, and different link charts? There were many link charts uh, about, we at the beginning, we couldn't figure out how they actually knew each other, um, that they had no previous relationship that we knew of but that um they had spoken they knew each other from the past they this was a very new thing as far as them hanging out together and so that that was a mystery at the very beginning like why even her what, what oh, happened okay. was this a spur of the moment thing was it planned nobody knew and so we we did start with a number of link diagrams as far as her and her friends and who reported it and why and then well we found out parents were involved and potentially brother was involved there was a whole nother thing of well who else could be involved you know roommates or friends or who knew and who didn't it yeah. became a very large thing. In that situation, or maybe some new analysts might think when you think of link chart, it's just something that you're going to present on. But actually, link charts can just be a way to keep data organized. And it Absolutely. can just be, you You can just be the only audience, right? That that's ever well, going to see. And probably the most important thing is they develop leads. You know, the, the, the rules of three, where you start talking about, well, if this person knew about it and this person knew about it and this person knew about it and they're all linked and this other guy is linked to all of them, let's go talk to them. You know, so you develop leads by seeing who knows who, and then you can use timelines to look at who knew what, when, and, and again, find more people to talk to, more places to go and start piecing together the story. Yeah. Do you have, just why I'm thinking about it, 
do you have any advice for analysts? We haven't talked about link charting too much on, on the podcast here. So do you have any advice for link charting for our audience? Yeah, I mean, I always tell people that there's sometimes you build a chart and you're doing it for yourself. Um, and sometimes you build it for an audience. And I think that analysts should separate those things. When you build a chart for yourself, there's nothing that's too small or too stupid or too insignificant to put on the chart put ideas out there. Like don't, don't shortchange yourself. Like you might have a receipt that you don't understand and it's not important. And maybe when at the end of the day, it's not important, but throw it on the chart anyway. You just never know. I I like link diagramming, especially as a way to organize your thoughts more than anything. You, most of the charts that I've created, like never go anywhere. A detective never sees them. A courtroom never sees them, Um, but they're a great way to just organize your data, organize your thoughts. Um, So I I highly recommend you do that. And then when you do your production one, use your notes, take the stuff that you threw on there. And, you know, sometimes you're throwing stuff at a wall and seeing what sticks and all the stuff that sticks, pull it out. Um, And it's going to give you a greater understanding of that. So when you are presenting it to a detective or or to a chief or whatever, you're going to know the background, you're going to know the in-depth detailed stories. So that's how I do it. Um, There's a hundred ways to skin a cat, I suppose, but... (laughs) Yes. So I I guess just back to the case real quick. Was this a scenario that she she just uh, turned away his affection or what was what was the motive? Did you ever find that out? No. And and I think that I I don't think that Jared Chance ever talked, ever spoke. He never testified. He really didn't speak to detectives in interview. And I don't know that we'll ever get there. I personally believe that uh, he was, I think that he's a very disturbed individual, clearly. There was a history of him playing with guns. I think he was playing with a gun and he shot her. And I don't know if he meant to or not, um, but I think he shot her. I think he freaked out and didn't know what to do. And so, you know, people watched too many movies and thought that if he cut up the body and got rid of it, he would be scot-free. It's still, uh, yeah, it's something. Um Yes. You know, and, and that's a, I think that's a hard thing for the family. And it's a really hard thing for the detectives that um, we never found all of her. Um, I think that she deserves to be found. And, and and because we didn't, I guess we don't know the full story. We didn't have forensics for her entire body. And um, had we, we, we might know a little bit more. What's going on, analysts? My name is Manny San Pedro. I'm the technology director for the IACA. And Here is my public service announcement for analysts. Don't become overly reliant on Excel. Use it to analyze and break down your data. It's a fantastic tool. Fantastic. And it's free as part of the Microsoft Office offering. But don't use it as a database. Use a database as a database. Connect to the database with Excel. And then use it for your pivoting, for all your slicing and dicing, even developing your dashboard. But again, don't use Excel for everything because it may not be the best tool for you. Hi, this is Dawn Colossius. I just want you to know that when you hear or you think as an analyst, they don't know what they want us to do. Always remember, you don't have to wait. Show them, tell them, and be value added. Well, we'll try to lighten up here for the rest of the yeah. interview. Um, so I, I'm going to move on. You know, when we were talking in the prep call yesterday, you had mentioned the idea of understanding data origins. And yeah. so that's one thing I would like to explore in this next segment is just the difference between crime versus a crime report. Yeah. So I think that as analysts, we tend to forget where our data comes from. Um, We throw pins on maps and we develop charts and we look at data from a very bird's eye view place. And we forget that we actually, in my opinion, know very little about crime. We don't know anything about crime. We know about crime reporting. And I think that there's, it's a very different thing. I always joke that if I ever became a police chief and someone said, I want to reduce property crime by 10% in 24 hours, I would just fire 10% of my cops <laughs> um, because, because they don't actually want to reduce. We, we don't know anything about property crime, but we know how mm-hmm. property crime is reported. And what they're saying mm-hmm. is I want 10% fewer reports of property crime. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important to note. I also think it's really important to that we're, we're talking about human condition here, that when you look at your data sources and you say, 
anyone, I, I would challenge any analyst out there to map uh, violent crime in your area and then map poverty and then map race and then map education. And I bet you you're looking at the same map. And, it, and it's, un, it's an unfortunate thing, but but that's just the reality of how crime is in the United States. And, and I would venture to say any, you know, westernized country in the UK is going to be the same, um, that where you see poverty and a lack of education, where you see a large group of minorities is where you see your crime being reported. We, we have a very unfortunate thing in it that there's no such thing as an affluent black community in the United States. And that is an extremely hard topic to not only discuss, but to solve. It's it's not something that can be solved in an election cycle. It's not something that your city commissioners can lean into and get at for the next you know year. It's not a, a goal that you can throw on a board and hope to impact. Like this is something that's going to take 20 and 30 and 40 years for us to correct. And you can't ignore that as an analyst. And I, I think it's super important that we understand that when you look at reporting, when you look at the data that you see, um, that you understand what's happening in those communities, that each one of those pins represents a victim. They represent someone who had the worst day of their lives. When we as analysts get away from that and we start doing things like, hey, chief, you'll notice there's a 10% increase in violent crime in this area over the last three weeks. You know, maybe we need more officers. Maybe we don't, you know, maybe, maybe that's all domestic and it's happening inside. And maybe what we need is more social workers. Um, maybe our officers, I mean, the simple fact might be that a captain got on them and said, you guys, you better get out there and start doing your jobs or I'm going to put a foot in your butt. And they went out and they took a hell of a lot more reports than they normally do. People are more likely to report crime when they see a cop than if they have to go find one. So um, you have to consider where your data is coming from in that it's reporting, not actual crime, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It's funny. I am currently watching the show Snowpiercer. And it's funny that the last episode, the, the guy said, well, it, when I do things, there is no crime. And he's, he didn't understand the idea of needing basically a police department because he said there wasn't there was no crime and because to him if there's if there's a complaint he's there's no due process he's just going to like freeze their arm off or something like that it's a (laughs) sci-fi show but it was fascinating that that you you kind of mentioned that in terms of reporting it is the idea of what is defined what is reported what is the process that we analysts are a part of and right. it, it can be the stuff that's not reported the stuff that isn't necessarily fits into a, a checkbox on the report that might be the most important yeah and it's it's super important we have to stop saying as analysts we want to curb crime or we want to address a certain type of crime because in doing so, we have to make sure that we're being analytical about it. If we if we really wanted to address things like theft from automobile, we would light our parking lots better. We we would you know what I mean? Put in security cameras. We would increase patrol. Um, but at the same time, like more importantly, we'd get people to lock their doors and stop leaving crap on their seat. I mean, um, yeah. that th- that's something that you only understand when you understand how these crimes are committed and why. That that if you wanted to decrease crime, it's a huge problem. When you want to decrease crime reporting, you just tell officers to stay out of the neighborhoods where it's happening. And, and if you don't think that city commissioners and city officials and chiefs know that, like you are not paying attention. Chiefs have been, and I don't mean my chief or anyone, like I generally think that all of my commanders get it. And I'm, I'm very, very, like I said, I'm very lucky to have the leadership that I do because my commanders get it and they work very, very hard for their community. But I think across the country, there's some serious data manipulation that happens in everyone's trying to make themselves look better. And as analysts, you have to understand that. You have to understand your customer it sounds very negative, but at the same time, sometimes you can use this to your advantage because it does take some of the emphasis off the police department and puts it right back in the community's hands. If you say, hey, do you really want to impact crime or do you want to impact reports? Because if you want to impact crime, you have to change something about your community. That's a hard thing. It's, it's not an easy problem. And I, you know, Grand Rapids is doing their best to address it. Um, but And I think that some cities are, but across the nation, it's, it's a really difficult thing to do. Yeah. I, I think it's slowly but surely getting there. You know, I remember, you know, decades ago, they were the, old, the saying was, well, we can't arrest our way out of this problem. Yeah. And so yeah. you've got stuff like 
problem oriented policing projects and you got the idea of educating the public right Absolutely. when i was when i was at cincinnati police department there is a program there put your junk in your trunk so get right. it out of the way so they were trying to that. educate the public in order to reduce the the number of targets that are out there because if, if they don't see it most likely they won't break into it another thing is just, you, i think you mentioned lock the doors right yeah. there's there's a ton of situations where they'll just go house to house car to car car to car just ch- checking to see if the door is unlocked and if it's unlocked Absolutely. they'll go in there and just start going through stuff but if it's locked they'll just move on to the next one they're not necessarily going to take the time to break the window absolutely and so that that's why i say you have to understand how those reports are actually being um written you have to get in you have to deep dive into these to understand what's really happening like people don't understand and analysts forget this that the police department as a whole is a reactive force when you're reading police reports the event has already happened the crime has already happened and preventative policing in my opinion is a joke it doesn't happen what you're looking at is intelligence led policing the, that's what you want to say when you say oh we're doing crime prevention no you're doing intelligence led policing it's very different you're not just there to prevent crime you have objective data to support why it is you're doing what you're doing we need to educate the community that it's not just the police department's job that it, that it has to be a, a holistic approach from the community from your city leaders from everyone um, your your streets and signs division can have a lot more impact on traffic problems than the police department yeah and that's you know and and so i think as analysts it's super important that we understand where that data is coming from um the other thing is when you're comparing stuff i mean let's be real the ucr was the end all be all for police chiefs. Most chiefs in this country still ask about part one crimes, even though they're not even a thing. They say, hey, what are part one crimes looking like? And that's because they've been around for a hundred years unchanged. Mm-hmm. It was like what, 1920 something when um, <laughs> we started reporting this and nothing changed. Like NIBRS was a big change and a big step forward, but you still have to look at why they're looking at the data. It's a legislative thing. They're looking at where we should spend money, not necessarily how we curb crime in my individual community. And so as analysts, we have to be really careful about that, that like in Michigan, we have a MICR. Um, it's an MSP program, and we report to them, as every police department in Michigan does, what our crime numbers look like. Well, they're going to filter that data, and they're going to report on it in a different way than we would. And they're going to do that based on what the legislature tells them is important. So it's all about there, there's going to be politics in any of this, and you're looking at a very human problem. And as analysts, you have to understand that and you have to be able to use it to your advantage if you ever want to make a change in your department. All right. Back to the idea of it's not crime prevention, it's intelligence-led policing. Uh, Just Let's just take the example in Cincinnati Police Department, junk in your trunk program. I guess talk through like how that's not crime prevention, that's intelligence-led policing. Well, because what you've done, intelligence-led policing is all about, one, the ability to frame a problem. You've realized that there's a problem with theft from automobile. You've done the analytics to understand that one of the biggest problems that you've noticed in analyzing these reports is much of the stuff is left in plain sight in unlocked vehicles. And what you're doing is developing a systematic approach to curbing that particular crime report. So when you say like, hey, we're doing preventative policing, no, what you really did was took an intelligence process, you framed a problem, you looked for an outside the box systematic solution in a way that you could curb this behavior and you went out and had officers enact it. It's a perfect example of intelligence led policing. And so like it may be, we, we may be saying the same thing, it, mm-hmm. you know, but, but I, I believe that intelligence led policing is a better way to approach it. You took objective data to make a change in your community. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who say, oh, crime prevention or preventative policing, you're, you're doing one of two things. You're either doing guesswork that makes the community happy, or you're actually impacting crime. And if you're impacting crime, what you're doing is intelligence-led policing. I, I think it's also interesting what you said about it takes a village, basically, is what, you, it's, it's what you said. And I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating topic because I, I put myself in the shoes of police chiefs, right? If, if it's something within the police department, I am the leader of this entire police department. So how I envision a project or an initiative 
to go and it's within the the police department, I can have full control over. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to initiatives in which I have to work with other city departments and have to go the, the entire village, the entire city, then there's the idea of less control. Okay. I can, we can work together and we can, you know, share this initiative, but I'm going to have to rely on you to do certain stuff because that's outside of my, my swim lane, so to speak. I I'm, can't venture out there. I can control my lane, but I can't control all the other different lanes too. So I find that while most police chiefs are charismatic and can easily do that, it does land a whole different level of difficulty trying to work with all these other departments within the city. Sure. And and I think that the most successful police chiefs are the ones that can articulate that to the community. When there when there is something, you know what, if if you have an IA problem, if you have, you know, an officer issue, if you have something that's solely within the police department, sorry, I got a bulldog bark. <laughs> you want to talk up. I think that when you have a chief that understands that that the whole community has to be involved, that this is not a problem that's within the police department, that they are in control of solely, and they can work with other communities, those are going to be the ones that are successful within your city. But the, the key there is they have to understand the data. They have to understand how to articulate that to their community. Um, and they have to be free to do so. I find... Uh, you know, as I watch the news, as I hear police chiefs conferences all over the country, you can tell that many of them really genuinely care about the people in their community. They care about their officers. They care about the mission, but they're not always free to do what they know needs to be done, um, whether it's through politics or unions or whatever. It all almost always seems like they have their hands tied and they can't incorporate all of the things that they want to do. Or you can tell that they have a muzzle on them and someone's keeping them from saying <laughs> what they really want to say. And I think that's just the the nature of policing today is that it's become a very political thing. Um, and as analysts, we we have to be the ones that let, you know, objective, measurable data lead the way. And, and I'll tell you that some police departments do it really well, and some do not. And at some point, there's going to be a change. I think that our profession is very young, but we're going to get to a point where data will lead policing and chiefs can either go along with it and be successful or they cannot and they'll be replaced they won't have a choice good good conversation uh, let's let's finish up with personal interests sure. you uh, lead a nonprofit music group drums right i do yeah and so were you a drummer growing up i was i was in marching band in high school i marched drum and bugle corps for a few years um i was in western michigan's marching band i just loved it i loved it i've been teaching drumline and high school marching band since 2003 i've been writing quite a bit I've probably been at 20 or 30 programs across the country, a couple of universities. Um, I did a professional NFL drumline at one point. I, I just love it. I love the activity. I love what I, I always tell people that if you want to find the best kids in any school, and I absolutely mean this, the best kids, the best students, the best hearts go to the band room for whatever reason, like the absolute best kids are in music. Yeah. Did you say writing as in writing down? Yep. What, yep what's do. some examples of writing? I mean, I, I write and arrange I've written written and arranged for marching band. When you see the high school shows on the <laughs> for at halftime for the football games, somebody's yeah. got to write it. Somebody's got to arrange it. Oh, okay, and like the, the choreography and all the steps and all the dribble. And, 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 and then I got gotcha. you. I've been doing that now for gosh, almost twenty years. Makes me okay. feel. All right. So then talk, talk about this uh, nonprofit music group that you, you guys because yeah. you, you, this this group travels across the country, yep. right? Yep. So it's called uh, Fruitport Independent Percussion. And we have a winter guard as well um, that spins flags. And Fruitport's an amazing community. Um, the, just the Fruitport schools in general are just awesome. They're an incredible community. They really, really come together and, and build teams well. And we love being a part of their community music ensembles. And in the winter, um, we have kids audition in about November. And we compete in both the Michigan Alliance for Performing Arts and Winter Guard International. So we travel around the state of Michigan. Um, this year, we're going to go to Indiana and Ohio for a number of shows. And then we'll end at, uh, at World Finals in April in Dayton, Ohio. Um, but we travel with Every year, it's between 25 and 40 high school age students, and we do percussion. We, <laughs> we teach kids, uh, you know, I like to say that we teach kids about life through music. So um, we push them pretty hard. They're going to do about nine shows, nine or 10 shows, I think, this year. Um, they're going to travel, oh gosh, 
in the thousands of miles, I would think. Um, and I think we're going to see between 10 and 20,000 spectators. So, so this, this is like a travel league for those that might be familiar with yeah, sports. And, and this then is a travel league for marching band. Okay. Yep. I gotcha. So it's different yeah. high schools all coming yes. together and forming this, this group. Okay. Yep. We are an independent group and we accept kids from all over West Michigan. Yep. Okay. And they, they audition and have to make the group. And once they make the group, um, we'll get them, we'll get them music, we'll get them costumes, we'll get them drill. And it takes place inside and basketball floors. And um, you can Google Winter Guard International and you will see, you put it in YouTube, you'll see some incredible stuff. WGI is something else. Okay. And you could use some donations. Is that correct? Absolutely. So it's, it's, we're a 501c3 not for profit. Um, the kids do pay dues and those cover the absolute minimum that we need to survive. We rely solely on donations, corporate sponsorship, and fundraisers to make things like travel happen, to pay for gas. Uh, for all the music we play, we have to pay for copyright. We have to pay for recording rights. We have to pay for arrangement fees. We have to pay for insurance for the kids in case someone gets hurt at a show. I mean, Things like that just cost a heck of a lot of money. I think our operating budget is somewhere in the twenty to twenty-seven thousand dollar range every year, and we raise uh, about half of that through kids' dues, and so all the rest has to come from uh, from corporate and private donation. Okay, so we will put a link in the show notes uh, if you're interested in donating to Nick's cause. There, you can certainly do so, and I encourage it. So that is a really cool program that you're working on there it's it's yeah. so fascinating those, those personal interests with this podcast is so fascinating because I, I don't think I, I would have ever brought that up to you if we would have yeah. met you know at a conference or something I don't we probably wouldn't have got to the point where you know you're you're talking about the the music group that that you're yeah, helping I, manage I just love it man it's one of those things like me and my wife don't have kids yet and we it's one of those things we we love to spend our time doing it. It's how we met. We really believe that it's why we are the people we are today. The reason I have this drive, this willingness to learn. Um, I learned all that in marching band, how to be a teammate, you know, how to work together, how to push for something. I learned that in the marching band and then, and then I developed it into something great in the military and in the police department. So it's, it's kind of a really nice stepping stone and we just want to pass it on to to more kids. Very good. All right. Well, our last segment to the show is Words to the World. And this sure. is where you can promote any idea that you wish. Sure. Nick, what are your words to the world? My words to the world are be an analyst. I think that even if you're not an analyst, it doesn't matter if you're a cop or how you landed on this podcast, be analytical um, about your life, about the things that are going on. Yeah, I, I talk to my wife about it all the time that being an analyst has made me a better friend. It's made me a better homeowner. It's made me a better person. And I think that when we really start to dive into everything with that analytic mindset of what's causing what and what can I objectively measure and what systems can I build to make this better, um, we're, we're ultimately enriching our lives and the people around us. Very good. Well, I leave every guest with you've given me just enough to talk bad about you later. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> but I do appreciate you being on the show, Nick. Thank you so much. And you be safe. You as well.